Computers are everywhere, and they are all an amazing feat of design. But how do they respond to your input, keep time, save files, or display information? How do computers do what they do? The answer is simple. Computer logic. Well, it's not that simple. To make this stuff called logic, you need two things. Information and information processing. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Just what is information? Ones and zeros. Yep, that's pretty much it. But of course, we don't need to call them ones and zeros. We could have called them trues and falses, ons and offs, cats and dogs, or loop-de-loops and loop quantum gravity. The point is that information in its most basic form can be represented as a sequence of bits, each of which can be in one of two different states. It's just convenient to give them names, depending on the situation. For example, it's nice to call them ones and zeros when expressing positive integers, because they pretty much become a sequence of bits when expressed in base 2. Words can be represented as bits, based on agreed upon standards for which sequence of bits represents which letter or symbol. Similarly, any image or video can be represented with bits, based on previously agreed upon standards. You see all these graphics and sounds popping out of your viewing device right now? This is all they really are. A sequence of bits. Okay, so what are bits, really? Where are the ones and zeros in a computer? Well, it depends where you look. Your hard drive likes to call magnetization bits. Change in magnetization means 1, and no change means 0. Other parts of your computer like to call voltages bits. 5 volts means 1, 0 volts means 0. A bit doesn't necessarily need to be inside a computer either. A light bulb can be a bit, on or off. The results of a coin flip can be a bit, heads or tails. Literally anything that can be in two distinct states can act as a bit. So why do computers prefer the methods they use? Because it's easier to store and process bits in this form. You may have that image in your computer represented as bits, but how can you actually see it on your screen? How does a computer take your keystrokes and mouse clicks and understand them so you can play that video, save that document, or whatever? How does your computer interpret and manipulate information? Just like all information can be broken down into bits, all information processing can be broken down into Boolean logic gates. There are seven gates which take one or two bits and spit out a new one, each in a unique way. It's easier to think about these gates by calling the bits trues and falses. Consider the not gate. It takes a bit and spits out what the bit was not. Something that is not true is false, and something that is not false is true. Then there's the and gate. If I tell you that the sun is hot and the sky is blue, I'm telling you the truth because both these statements are true. But if I tell you the sun is hot and the sky is pink, I have technically lied to you, because one of those statements is false. The AND gate only spits out a true if it gets two trues, and spits out a false otherwise. Now the OR gate. If I tell you the sun is hot or the sky is blue, that's the truth, since either statement is true. If the sun is hot or the sky is pink, that is also true, because one of the statements is correct. But what if I tell you the sun is ice cold or the sky is pink? That's a lie, since I have told you not one single bit of truth. The OR gate only spits out a false if it receives two falses, and spits out a true otherwise. Now the XOR gate, also known as the exclusive OR gate. This is just a different kind of OR. It's true that you can get a side of fries or salad with your meal, but not both. Similarly, the XOR gate only spits out a true if one bit or the other is true, but not both. The last three gates are just inverses of ones we've already seen. The NAND gate spits out literally not what the AND gate would spit out. Instead of only spitting out a true when given two trues, it only spits out a false when given two trues. To make it extra confusing. Similarly, the NOR gate spits out exactly not what the OR gate would spit out, and the XNOR gate spits out exactly not what the XOR gate spits out. Speaking of which, NAND and NOR are horrible names. How is someone even supposed to know if you're talking about a NAND gate or a NAND gate? So anyway, what in the world can you do with these gates? Well, I'm glad you asked. Assemble them together like this, and you can add any pair of 3-bit numbers together. A little expansion, and it would be fit for a calculator. Grab a harmonic signal, and you can arrange a bunch of gates like this to count upwards at even intervals. Add in a bit more detail, and it would be fit for a digital watch. Arrange them in some even more complicated way, and you can watch online videos. Every computation is just a clever arrangement of gates. So what are gates, really? Well, traditionally, they're made of transistors. A transistor is like a switch, but it works based on the physical properties of the materials it's made of rather than moving parts. For example, an NMOS transistor lets current through it when a voltage is applied. Meanwhile, a PMOS transistor stops current when a voltage is applied. With these, you can make all gates, and in turn, any kind of computation. And just like bits, 
Gates could in theory be made out of almost anything. You could make them out of billiard ball tubes, water valves, or even dominoes. So why are transistors so popular? They're sturdy, small, fast, and affordable. So your computer can be sturdy, small, fast-ish, and affordable-ish. Sounds good enough to me. Now, we know how to store any kind of information and how to do anything to that information. All ground has been covered. We can now, in principle, compute anything, any way we want. Except quantum mechanics. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There's a new kind of computer being developed which is capable of processing information in whole new ways. Quantum mechanics is weird, but it's also awesome, because of all the unique mathematical rules it operates under. And these equations can be used to our advantage. For example, you can create whole new ways of representing information. In a quantum system, you can have a 1 or a 0 like before, but you can also have something sort of in between 1 and 0, a superposition. It's a lot like having a coin that can not only be in a heads or tails state, but also any other possible orientation. These quantum bits, or qubits, can do more than ordinary classical bits can. But there's a catch. Although qubits can be in so many more states than classical bits, as soon as you try to measure one, its superposition collapses to either a 1 or a 0. It's like our qubit coin is in the dark, and the only way we can measure it is to smack a palm down onto it, forcing it to be either heads or tails, never knowing what orientation it was in before. That's why it's very important to be careful about reading qubits in a quantum computer, because they change as soon as you try to read them. Now, because measuring a qubit actually changes it, measurement is sometimes considered to be a quantum gate. It takes in a qubit, which could be in any state, and spits out a qubit which is either 1 or 0. This gate is just what ends up happening when we try to read information from a qubit. It doesn't spit out 1s and zeros randomly, though. The probability of spitting out one or the other is related to the state that the qubit was originally in. Going back to our coin analogy, the more the coin is tipping towards heads, the more likely you'd end up measuring heads. Ditto for tails. So at least we have something to work with. Okay, you know where this is going. What are qubits, really? Well, once again, it depends. There aren't really any standards yet, since physicists are still toying around with these things. Sometimes, a property called spin is used, where an electron or nucleus being in spin up is a 1, and spin down is a 0. Sometimes, the polarization of a photon is used, where being polarized vertically can be a 1, and horizontally can be a 0. Yep, you heard right. You can make a quantum computer out of light. Now what about those quantum gates? There's the already mentioned measurement gate, which takes a qubit and rids it of its superposition. But it's the gate that actually allows us to read a qubit. The swap gate takes two qubits and swaps them. The Pauli X gate is a lot like the classical NOT gate. If we use our qubit coin analogy, the X gate flips a qubit coin in the complete opposite direction. There are a bunch of other gates which take one qubit coin and flip it to face another direction. There are also controlled gates, where the gate being controlled can only operate if the control bit is a 1. If it's a 0, nothing happens. And if it's in a superposition, it sort of happens and doesn't happen at the same time. That's quantum mechanics. It can be pretty... complex. So now, what can you do with quantum gates? Well, technically, you could perform the same computations as any classical computer. But quantum computers are so much more difficult to control, so there's really no point doing this. But there are things that you can do with a quantum computer that are impossible for classical computers. For example, breaking today's digital security. Your session on a social network or bank is encrypted by a technique called RSA. I'll spare the details, just let it be known that for someone to get through security, they need to factor a number which is a product of two primes. 15 is such a number, equaling 5 times 3, each of which is prime. The task is to try to find these primes, given their product. It's easy to do with 15, but what if the number is hundreds of digits long, as they actually are in practice? To solve this with a classical computer, really, your only choice is trial and error, and your computer would take so long to find the answer that it would become obsolete by the time the computation finished. But, arrange a few quantum gates like this, and you get a number popping out, which, if it meets certain criteria, can be tossed into a classical algorithm to get the factors out. If these qualifications are not met, you can just try again with some slight modifications to one of the gates. At first, this process seems just like another form of trial and error, but this has been calculated to find the answer much faster than any classical means. Quantum computers have already broken 15, 21, and 143 into their prime factors, and in the future it could likely be done with the numbers that banks and social networks use to secure your information. Well, that kind of sucks. The dawn of quantum computers will essentially expose everyone's personal conversations and bank accounts? 
Well, maybe not. Quantum computers can break current security techniques, but they also have a few new communication tricks up their sleeves. Say you and your bank want to communicate using quantum information to ensure that your conversation be confidential. If your qubits are implemented as polarized light, you can simply communicate through a fiber optic cable. But what if someone tries to eavesdrop? If they simply try to listen in on the conversation, they are measuring the qubits, which, as we learned, inevitably interferes. They would essentially be shoving a measurement gate in the middle of the cable, changing the entire system. Okay, what if they copy the incoming qubits so they can read one copy and send the other down the cable to ensure their interference is not noticed? Luckily, due to something called the no-cloning theorem, qubits cannot be copied, so the eavesdropper has no choice but to create his own dummy messages to send along if he steals the real message. The point is that there is no possible way for an eavesdropper to listen into a quantum conversation without disturbing it, so your bank can develop sophisticated communication techniques so you too could detect if an eavesdropper is somehow listening in and changing the messages. There are more communication tricks that take advantage of other things, like entanglement and quantum teleportation, and a method using entanglement has even been recently demonstrated in three-way secure quantum communication. And there are many more ideas on how to take advantage of quantum computing, like running simulations of the human body or the universe. Quantum computers could greatly enhance our understanding of how medical treatments affect us, or give us a deeper understanding of the cosmos. All that being said, there's still a long way to go for quantum computing. As mentioned before, quantum computers are difficult to control, and physicists are still trying to get the darn qubits to do what they're supposed to do. But progress is being made. This field is still young, and as with any technology in its infancy, there are likely many innovative ways to use it that haven't even been conceived of yet. Prepare for the future. This is all just a part of the seemingly ceaseless march of technological advance. We have really come a long way since Boolean algebra was first devised 160 years ago.